uh, in terms of his own ideas. Uh, secondly, uh, he had a lab out at uh, a small airport, which seemed like a, uh, an institution of the sort that people always talk about the airport lab as its own you know, unique environment, and it's worth hearing about what that was like. Jimmy is known for a regular Thursday afternoon seminar, where every Thursday afternoon there was a seminar and he never knew if it was officially one people could get credit for or not, whether people should get graded or not, but there was always something a Thursday afternoon if he was in town, and many people here experienced that seminar. Um, finally, there were social occasions of all sorts, uh, and the ecological optics conference. So the core of tonight, I thought, would be Sverker's photographs and discussion around them. That is, as we see pictures, we can start to identify who's in them, what they were doing, what the issues were. Um, so um, that would be you know, an excellent anchor for a lot of this. Plus, there are a few people that some of us haven't identified yet, and anybody who can help identify them would be greatly <laughs> appreciated. So, with that, um, I think we'll get started. I think um, I might ask uh, Hal or John to. Uh, talk a little bit about working with Jimmy on a dissertation. See if you think there are any sort of typical experiences or if each were unique. And uh, go from there. Uh, I, I came to Cornell uh, to work with Jimmy Gibson in 1966. I was there for four years. I never called him Jimmy the whole time. It was always Mr. Gibson, and uh, amongst the graduate students, we never called him Jimmy. That was re reserved for his colleagues. We called him JJ. It took me years, many, probably decades, before I said anything else to him. Uh, it, 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 we all held him in wonderfully warm regard. He was an astonishingly pleasant, warm person. When you see that picture of him smiling and holding up one finger and looking at you, what you're actually missing is the movement that of, the, of the mouth. He constantly, when he smiled, he would sort of twitch up and down ding, 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 as he was talking. He had this quizzical look all the time. What he loved was discussion ideas. Now, I, I've been to lots of universities now. I have very rarely been to a place that had the same kind of intellectual ferment that just constantly surrounded Jimmy Gibson. Um, other people have often co have commented on the fact that I like to go to the cafeteria with my students and talk about ideas. And yet, I'm not sure why they're commenting, because I think this is normal, uh, and this is what he did all of the time. There were wonderful occasions in his house when there would be a visiting speaker from who knows where. Am I going to Flukiger from Switzerland? Uh, perhaps Natelli from Italy? Uh, Johansson? I, I remember the time Rudy Arnheim came, and he turned out to be an exception. Because what we would do was we would have listened to a talk, then we would have all been wonderfully friendly and pleasant uh, around some sort of meal. Then we would gather at Gibson's house and we would kind of circle like wolves <laughs> and wait for an opportunity for the, the real meat of the evening to start. And then you would attack the guy's ideas, root and branch. And this was what you thought you were supposed to do. And it's what you did also with your colleagues or college students, and it was a wonderful experience. And I remember being in his seminar and saying to people, look 
<laughs> what I want you to do is I'd like you to listen to what I have to say before you attack it. <laughs> and so I said, I'd like you to listen until I get through to the end of the paper, and then you can have a go at it. And it was actually about Butler's work with uh, monkeys, and the astonishing thing that he discovered was that if they were in some little enclosure with a monkey, and a, there was a monkey and a snake, and there was a, a pull string that would turn the light on. So there's a snake, the monkey's scared, the light goes out. The monkey no longer sees the snake. Does he breathe a sigh of relief? No, he turns that light on as fast as he can. Because the way the snake went out of the roof is not information that the snake no longer exists, right? So, I, and I was going through that analysis and then a whole lot of other possibilities, other things you could do to remove the snake and suggesting things about what this would mean epistemologically. And I just insisted with Kaplan, who was fierce, what a wonderful, incredibly fierce guy. Everybody in child development was frightened of people in experimental psychology. Everybody in experimental psychology was frightened of the people in perception. And all of us in perception were frightened of George Kaplan. And George was frightened of his wife, <laughs> Eleanor. <laughs> but you argued fiercely with all of these people, and you had a great time doing it. And it went on all of the time. And how did this then finally get around to being a thesis at some point for me? Well, here is how it went. And I, I thought it was normal at the time, and I had discovered just how far away it is from many people's experience since then. I wrote some stuff, I gave it to Gibson, he got it back to me with comments. I rewrote it, I gave it back to him, I got it back from him with comments. I wrote it again, and each time the time interval was getting shorter and shorter. Until finally, he worked all night, and I picked up my thesis in the morning, at breakfast time when he was asleep, worked on it all day and gave it to him, gave it to him at night. And this went on day after day after day, as I was thinking up new things, as he was making fresh and interesting comments, and I was constantly rewriting this thing, until we both felt, zing, 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 some perception action cycle finally resolved in something invariant, and that was the thesis. And it was a great experience, and with very little tweaking, it turned into a book, a nice little book. And I have told my colleagues frequently, this is the most important thing I ever wrote, because everything in it is wrong. And I've spent the rest of my career attacking that 1974 book. I, you know, it's a funny thing, I can't remember meeting Gibson, Jimmy, JJ, for the first time. It's like the accretion never occurred. He was always somehow there. And the warmth, the pleasantness, the sociability, the evenings, the dinners, the going to Thanksgiving in his house. And afterwards, he got out fencing masks and swords and foils, as we learned we'd both been fencing. And we fenced up and down his dining room. It was super. What a guy. Fascinating. And that warmth, you will still find it in Jean Gibson, his daughter. I, I was just amazed. I had dinner with her a couple of years ago at Cornell on the occasion of the celebration of Mrs. Gibson's life. I had dinner with her, and I, it, was, it was unnatural how attracted I felt to Jean. The same warmth is still there in, in that family. They were wonderful people. You know, many people are kind of frightened of other psychologists who argue with them. I was certainly frightened. Uh, of uh, Julie Hopeberg, and I was very happy to hear that her pick, her pick was just as frightened. <laughs> because there was something in the way that he did things that you felt challenged. But when Gibson argued with you, you felt that's really interesting. I, I'd like to close with one story. How did he just challenge you and excite you at the same time? So here goes. I was really interested 
in the notion of reality and appearance. And you know, the classic, one of the classic problems is the bent stick in water. It goes back to Greek times. Actually, often when you talk to Jimmy Gibson, you realized whatever problem you were talking about with him, he knew its intellectual history. And so he saw it in an enormous context. So we were really interested in this. So we had a bent stick in water, and it looked straight. And we had a straight stick in water, crossing the air water boundary, and it looked bent. I'm sitting on the table, it was that Thursday afternoon seminar. I took it eight times for credit. And I thought this was normal, actually, <laughs> until I went elsewhere. And I was, I was just delighted at Harvard, where I, I taught there. And one guy took my seminar three times for credit, and quite a few took it twice for credit. And those people are now scattered around, like Dean at McGill and uh, running a lab in Oxford. Wonderful, wonderful people. I think this is a super idea. Don't go through a set of ideas once. Go through it again and again and again until it gets deeper. So there's the next thing of water. And Al Jonas, who was also a really good critic of ideas, was looking at these things and he just started twiddling with it. And you know what happens when you take the stick that looks bent and you turn it? Well, the answer is it stays where it is. It maintains its profile. If it was truly bent, it would do that. But it doesn't. And four-year-olds, when I showed them what Al discovered, <laughs> said, hey, it's straight. When they looked at the bent stick that maintained its profile in motion. So that was fascinating. So I was describing to Gibson what we're going to do, how we're going to do this. We're going to take the bent stick, we're going to rotate it, and say yes. And it's going to maintain its profile, yes. And the, the one that's truly bent, that looks straight, when we rotate that, it's going to be, um, it's going to start wobbling, it's going to be really interesting, then we'll restore it back to the apparently straight, yes. And we'll have some sticks outside the water, the one will be bent, the one will be straight, and we'll ask the kids to match them, so it's not just talk, yes. So what do you think? And he said, um, what's a straight stick? <laughs> Straight, it's well, straight, it's um, I have like seven definitions started to come to mind. And I realized he starts really low, he thinks very basically, very simply, and you have to get the basics right, and then a lot of other stuff will become important. And so that's the way he challenged you, and when he challenged you, you felt. That's a really good question, and it was a treat to be around this very warm and inspiring mind. Thank you. Well, um, yeah, John and I were in the same seminar a lot of those eight times. <laughs> um, I think I came a little bit later to Cornell, but I also took. Uh, JJ's seminar eight. Um, and thinking back, I, I, I'd like some help with this from some of the other people. I'm trying to remember what it was about all those eight times. Because he, he didn't, he didn't actually do the same thing every time. Um, I remember one year we did one semester. We spent uh, going through Kafka's Principles of Visual Psychology, or at least as far as we as far as we got. We did have a and then in one semester we did we did Helmholtz. We never got the first as far as JJ JJ believed in close reading. <laughs> so you'd start with a page and take a sentence and you could argue about it for the rest of an hour or two hours, as I recall. Um, I think most of the other times we, we went from JJ's own writing, that is, he, he would be writing something. Um, and uh, I guess at that point, um, the 66 book was done and out, and, and he was starting to think about things that would uh, ultimately end up in the 79 book, although I'm, I'm talking about the late 60s, early 70s at this point. So I remember there were this, this whole series of, of meetings about affordances where he would come in one week with a, 
he, this, those were the days of the uh, mimeograph machine. If anyone wants to undertake to explain what a mimeograph machine is. Like, um, and uh, so I guess he would write something up. There's something he'd written during the course of the week, and uh, maybe a few pages, and, and get it um, mimeographed up and pass it out. And I remember that one, one week there'd be affordances, and then the next week there was something like more on affordances, and then the following week it was like still more on affordances. Um, and um, who can help me here? As I recall, he was called speaking, purple perils. They were called purple perils, right? But yeah, as I recall, he would sort of start reading, and he would. It was the same thing as going through pulpit. So he would read a sentence or two, and then and then people would object and uh, argue about it, and and maybe in the course of a, of a couple of days, the seminar was two hours, we might get through these these few pages, if not, but. Um, it's interesting to try and think about what, he, what the nature of his interaction was that facilitated um, that sort of openness to people saying what they thought. I mean, because you think of somebody uh, who's, uh, who likes to discuss, as John said, or argue, as someone else might say, you, you, you tend to think maybe of that as closing down discussion, but it was really just the opposite. And I, I think there was just a sense of um, maybe in part confidence on his part. I mean, he, he didn't he didn't feel like you know if you if you said if you disagreed with him that he was somehow being wounded in his ego or uh, feeling defensive about it. He would be um, if he thought you were right, he would say so. If he thought you were wrong, he would say so. Um, there was just a, a, a kind of uh, intellectual, I guess, genuine, genuine intellectual curiosity and openness, um, and uh, that uh, that made this kind of discussion very, very, uh, very revealing. And uh, so that over the course of years, what I had the feeling of really getting somewhat inside of his mind. I mean, maybe that's, that's saying too much, but getting a, a feel for a way of thinking, a way of talking about, about the, uh, uh, the world, the perception, action, and so forth. Um, and I was taking them for credit, too. And as I recall, uh, if, at least if you were taking it for credit, you had to write something. And so, um, and uh, I don't remember him saying anything about what to write. There was just an expectation that you would write something, and at the end, and so somehow during the course of the semester, something would come to mind, and, and, uh, and I would write it. And, um, I think it was one of the first semesters I was, you know, reading through his books and going to seminars, and I think there was a footnote in the 1950 book that I puzzled over a bit. And, ended up kind of writing a paper on it, and I got the paper back, and he had some, not a lot of comments, but they seemed to like it. And then some years later, when I was um, thinking about doing a dissertation, I thought about this and that, and I had a, I guess I had an idea, and I went in and talked to him about it, and he didn't say a lot, <laughs> he it maybe wasn't going anywhere, I went back and thought again. Um, and I thought back to this paper I'd done, I thought that seemed all right, and I went and talked to him about that, and he said that seemed like a good idea, and I kind of wrote a dissertation, and um, it was a little different, I think, than John's experience, because I, I, I think I may be less, a little, a little more reclusive or something, because I sort of went off and wrote it, and turned it in, got attacked with some comments. Um, but, um, uh, there was certainly a, a sense of, you know, openness and interest and responsiveness. But it, it, there was, I had, a, um, as I recall, and people correct me here, that JJ was a late night person, and um, we, we, 
the seminar, I think, was at 4 in the afternoon on Thursday. Yeah. And uh, uh, JJ would come in sometime after lunch, maybe 2 or something. And, and he would sit, he had a secretary, he would sit in the office with the secretary and go through his correspondence and so on. And then he would come in and have the seminar and then he would sort of retreat to his office. And I guess he worked there or worked at home. Very, very late into the night, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I had the, at the, the time, the time I was there, I guess most of the, most of us were there, he was um, really focusing on his, his writing and more than on doing research and doing experimental stuff. And so um, I think I had the, you know, the feeling of, of being a bit on my own in terms of getting that part of things together and, and, and so on. He, was, he, was, he loved to talk about things and, and argue about them, but he wasn't, he wasn't at that point, although I certainly gather he'd spent a long time in the, earlier in his career doing it, he wasn't at that point in the lab putting things together. I remember there was one, one seminar that was, I think he was um, working on the, the section uh, where he talks about evidence for direct perception. I think that was a seminar one semester. But I don't really remember to what extent he had specific topics every semester and to what extent it was sometimes just what he happened to be working on um, at the moment. Does anyone else want to talk about the Phil, do you want to talk about the, yeah. Do you want to talk about what? Uh, I guess you can talk about the, talk about my dissertation. <laughs> um, yeah, it reinforced a lot of uh, what I was saying. Um, I enjoyed the seminars I attended. Them for the, I was caught out for five years. Um, I'd arrived with an MA and I wanted to be out in two so you could see what happened to me got totally seduced um, by the intellectual atmosphere there, and, uh, very stimulating. And I attended a seminar faithfully the whole five years, so I, I beat your record. Um, in, in fact, the seminar was also held during the summertime. If you were around in the summers, school was over. And vacation periods, he would be there. He, I think Christmas and Easter, maybe, he, he did the whole thing. If they fell on Christmas Day or Easter Day. <laughs> but, um, and the Kafka book, I remember, I think we got through just the first couple of chapters, but my memory of, the, of um, the book stops when, when Kafka talks about the uh, anecdote of, um, Kafka is trying to differentiate between the behavioral world and the phenomenal world of the observer, if I remember right. And there's a story in the book about, um, a traveler who arrives at an inn in the middle of a snowstorm and the uh, innkeeper says, um, how did you get here? Which way did you come? And the traveler indicates with his hand, well, I came from that way. And the innkeeper says in amazement, you just walked across Lake Constance. On hearing this, the traveler falls over dead of a heart attack. <laughs> and I suppose that was supposed to illustrate the difference between the behavioral world and the phenomenal world, <laughs> to call for the satisfaction. Um, of course, that was probably where we stopped criticizing Kafka and more, more constructive things. Um, but I thought the Gestalt's hypothesis were really the springboard for Gibson's ideas um, as, an, as an antidote to the empiricist. Um, I don't know why people find Gibsonian ideas, paradigms, so um, antithetical or so difficult. Um, it's a no-brainer. I, I came to Cornell because I was converted before I got there. I was at Simon Fraser in Vancouver, and I read a uh, section of the visual world, I think. Um, I immediately thought, I mean, this is just terrific stuff. And um, my professor happened to be, or he wasn't in perception, an ex-Cornellian. And so it helped facilitate um, my very late application 
to graduate school at Cornell as opposed to staying in this wonderful city of Vancouver uh, for my PhD. Um, and subsequently, I got interested in it. My dissertation was all over the place at first. I was interested in sway, I was interested in locomotion, I was interested in um, the um, optical array, under transformations of various kinds. I settled on slant perception as a more traditional uh, thing, trying to get down to the basics of perceptual adaptation and normalization of perception under viewing conditions, static versus looting and so on. I tried to take adaptation further into the ad active observer sort of uh, paradigm. I didn't follow it up much because I went to um, San Diego and I've been there ever since. Um, the reason why I went to San Diego wasn't for intellectual reasons. I was in love with my wife. She got a postdoc at the Department of Neurosciences, Helen Neville, and I opted to go along. She said, it doesn't snow in San Diego. I think it was the other reason. <laughs> <coughs> She'd gone there earlier as a spec um, visit. And so we ended up there, I got postdoc with the, guess what? The Center for Human Information Processing. <laughs> I think Gibson was appalled, but um, in fact, we, it was a joke, human information processing. We used to laugh and snicker at that, and there I was. And uh, Bob Boynton was there, and uh, Don Norman was there, and in the cloud was there. I tried to fit in, but it was very difficult. I didn't find my intellectual feet. Uh, I moved into the Department of Pediatrics, actually, and uh, did some work with development. But anyway, um, I found Gibson incredibly stimulating the whole time I was there. I never stopped listening to him. And, uh, the seminars always held my attention. There was never a time when I drifted off and thought about other things. And he did have this wonderful way of um, challenging you without putting you down. I think it's a very, very gift. Very, very, very few people have that. Um, I'm now a clinical psychologist. I, I work with brain injury and uh, do therapy and uh, a whole bunch of things, work for the courts and so on. And I have to try very hard <laughs> to be like that. I think it's my model in terms of challenging people without putting them down. Challenging their way of life, challenging their unreal ideas, challenging their lifestyles, uh, all sorts of their values, all sorts of things in order to get them straight. And um, it's very hard to do that without scaring people or frightening or um, intimidating them or um, demeaning them. And it's a very, very gift to have. I gather George Washington had that. I was listening to him. <laughs> country's hero. Um, apparently he had that quality of his leading man and he became a great leader because he could accept people's mistakes without um, destroying their careers and so on and have people follow them. I think Gibson has that quality. Um, it got difficult when he wasn't able to accept some ideas that would compromise his position. Um, I find it very difficult to accept the idea of studying perception and abstract and the theoretical and the philosophical without trying to understand the mechanisms of perception. And uh, how does it work physiologically? What, how do you translate this into um, real mechanisms, not intervening variables and, and boxes and arrows and that sort of thing? And he would get very impatient with people who wanted to challenge, or, or not challenge him because he wasn't interested, but take his ideas into those, those areas. It's a waste of time, and already yet it's a black box sort of thing. So who is proud to be a dust bowl and a I think that's uh, the paradigm he was working with. But he, of course, has taken empiricism to a totally different realm. And, uh, I'm very pleased to see an audience like this of such international renown and stature. It's wonderful for me to be here. Um, he was a terrible driver, by the way. I, I, mean, I, I don't know if anybody's driven with him. Um, but I have on occasion, I couldn't believe it. Here was a guy who was a you know, Mr. Perception Man, <laughs> Mr. Locomotion. <laughs> and, but he, I don't know if he had accidents, but he would scare the hell out of me. 
People, I scare the hell out of people when I drive, so. But do, do you know why he was such a bad driver? No. Okay, the, the story is, according to him, he had been tested and his peripheral vision was very good. It was exceptionally good. So he could drive while looking at his passenger. <laughs> so he'd be driving along, yes. looking at you, talking to you, and theoretically, then he'd be observing everything else peripherally. And he'd also break abruptly and turn corners abruptly on icy roads. And, oh, he seemed to know what he was doing, though. I never did have an accident with him. So, I think this is a good time to move to the pictures because everybody else can join in around those. I just tell them to follow this procedure. No, I didn't. But uh, about uh, Jimmy's driving. My wife and I were at Cornell 6970, and uh, he had, since we were new, we lived around the corner from him. Uh, he often entertained us, he and, his, and Jackie. And one night we were going to a party that the students were holding, and we were driving along in a town where he had lived at that time for what, 30 years? And they were looking at a map trying to find where the student lived. And they would begin arguing about whether to turn left or to turn right and so on. Finally, my wife looked over over the shoulder at, at the map they were holding and said, uh, Jimmy, you're holding the map upside down. <laughs> so here are the two great perceptionists that they're holding the map upside down. So we went on toward the uh, party. And Jimmy was driving uh, erratically, as uh, he often did. It was snowy. We were worried about ending up in a ditch. And uh, he didn't really know quite which direction to go, so he slams on his brakes. And the car behind him almost skids into it. And Jackie said to him, he said, Jimmy, that man almost ran into you. He said, oh, well, let me go ask him for directions while he stopped. <laughs> And then when we got to the party, uh, he insisted on parking on the sidewalk. And someone said, you'll, you'll get a ticket, you'll get told. And he said, oh, no, don't no, no worry about it. He went in, it wasn't 30 minutes later, a cop was at the door to give him a ticket for having parked on the sidewalk. I think he talked himself out of the ticket. These are from the famous Ecological Optics Conference of 1970. Sperker here was the photographer, and uh, so he has the photographer's point of view for the conference. And you will see various participants. Uh, so how many recognize somebody at the table in the picture? Just like this. 
be before we identify the dark hair guy. Oh, no, that's not that's it. That's it. Right? Oh, that's yeah. it. Yeah. I don't know who the dark hair guy is. Yeah, no, that at least identified. Is that King? Oh, is that King? Yeah. Oh, it's
It's probably put up by Hofburg or something. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's an experiment because it's stuck on the table. And yet nobody... No, I don't think so. Yeah. Sure. 
Jerry. Jerry, yes. Uh, and uh, in front of me, so uh, in the picture, is John Roberts. John Roberts, the, the uh, singing partner of Tony Barron. Was Roberts also a student of Gibson's? No. He was, what, nicer? Nicest. Yeah. And it's Bob Shaw, that is, no, is it Bob Shaw?